Welcome to the Michael Shermer Show. I'm your host, Michael Shermer. Today's episode is being brought to you by Oregon State University, which is inviting you to participate in their upcoming Provost Lecture Series featuring the great neuroscientist David Eagleman. It's a free virtual event next Wednesday, October 27th from 6 to 7.30 p.m. Pacific Time. So that's next Wednesday, October 27th at 6 o'clock Pacific Time. You can register for the free event at beav.es slash provost hyphen lecture. That's beav, they're the beavers, Oregon State beavers, beav.es slash provost hyphen lecture. If you forget all that, just Google Oregon State University comma David Eagleman pops right up. I just checked. Uh, I know David. I met him at TED years ago. Uh, He gave this terrific talk in which he put this jacket on, this neuro jacket thing that was going to convert our applause uh, or any of our response uh, into sensory uh, touch on his uh, torso. And uh, it was it was quite the demonstration. He is one of the most interesting uh, scientists and writers uh, working today. He's a neuroscientist at Stanford and an internationally uh, best-selling author. His, he's the founder of two venture-backed companies, Neosensory and brain check, and he also directs the Center for Science and Law. It's a nonprofit institute. And he's best known for his work on sensory substitution, time perception, brain plasticity, neural law, and synesthesia, in which your senses get crossed, uh, like people that can uh, see colors with their fingertips. And uh, when I was a kid, I had synesthesia of, I could see the, the days of the week had different colors. Like Monday was red, Tuesday was brown, Wednesday was orange, and so on. I have no idea why that happened, but uh, but David explains this, and uh, uh, and you can see some of this in the international best-selling PBS uh, series that he uh, hosts, The Brain with David Eagleman, and the companion book to it, The Brain, The Story of You. I've seen his series and, and read his books. He's terrific. In addition to his 120 academic publications, he has many popular books. His latest one is Live Wired. I want to get him on the show here soon to discuss this. It's about brain plasticity, which I'm happy to hear about because and now that I'm in my mid-60s, it's glad to know I can still learn new things and that the brain is still plastic enough to keep growing and learning, which is good. Anyway, check it out, uh, the Oregon State University Provost Lecture Series with the great David Eagleman next Wednesday, October 27th at 6 p.m. Once again, you can register for the free event at beav.es slash provost hyphen lecture, or just Google Oregon State University, comma, David Eagleman, and it pops right up. All right. Thanks for listening. Before I introduce today's guest, I want to tell you about our sponsor, Wondrium, W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M. Wondrium is the former Great Courses, the teaching company. The uh, courses I've been telling you about for years, they're my favorites. I've produced two myself, and I listen to well, I've probably taken at least 100 courses or at least several dozen, many dozens. In any case, they're now streaming, and the Wondrium package includes not just all the great courses, but also documentary series and documentary films and other uh, online content packages. For example, so you just look here, I just use it on my phone mostly. Uh, I see they have a new film that they've just dropped, The Atomic Cafe. Yes, a classic. It's an hour and a half documentary. Uh, here it is. Armageddon has never been so darkly funny. This 1982 cult classic juxtaposes Cold War history, propaganda, music, and culture, seamlessly crafted from government-produced educational and training films, newsreels, and advertisements. I, I vaguely remember seeing this back in the early 80s, uh, when I got interested in, in uh, understanding the Cold War better. And, uh, I think this is the one with all the duck and cover drills that, People like me and my age, when I was in grammar school, we had to duck underneath our little wooden desk as if that was going to protect us from a nuclear holocaust. In any case, this is the idea. Uh, Wondrium is a subscription service, and uh, then that gives you total access to all their content, which you pretty much could use hours a day for the rest of your life. There's just so much great content there. And you can get a free trial, one month free trial, if you do it through my podcast. So you go to wondrium.com slash Shermer. That's W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M, wondrium.com slash Shermer, and that gets you a free month trial. You can consume a lot of content in a month for free. And if you like it, you just keep subscribing. And if not, you cancel, and it's great. 
So I highly recommend it. Wondrium.com slash Shermer for the free trial. And uh, it's, it's, it's a great, great idea. Endless content to consume. All right. Thanks for listening. I am very, very pleased today to bring you live in person in my home with a recording set up by Brian Dalton, Mr. Deity, and his two camera crew here with uh, Steven Pinker. He was in town uh, visiting. We went for a couple of bike rides, and he visited some of his friends at UC Santa Barbara who were uh, his colleagues when he had a sabbatical here back in the 90s, back when he first wrote The Language Instinct and How the Mind Works. In his early works, his latest book is Rationality, What It Is, Why It Seems Scarce, and Why It Matters. As if he needs an introduction, he doesn't, but I'll read one anyway. He is the Johnstone Family Professor of Psychology at Harvard University, a two-time Pulitzer Prize finalist and the winner of many awards for his research, teaching, and books. He's been elected to the National Academy of Sciences and named one of of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People and one of Foreign Policy's 100 Leading Global Thinkers. His books include, and I'm going to read them in a different context here because that's how we began, uh, sitting there at my couch. Uh, I had a pile of his books stacked up next to me, as you'll see. And I just asked him, what's the through line? You know, given that the hindsight bias and the self-serving bias and the self-justification bias and all the things he writes about in rationality will kick in. Uh, but nevertheless, he, he had a nice long answer explaining what the through line is for the language instinct. His very first book, How the Mind Works, The Blank Slate, The Better Angels of Our Nature, Enlightenment Now, capping off with rationality. This is the key to me, the latest book, to all the others, because it's the tools by which we understand how the mind works, how language works, why we're violence, uh, violent and why it declined, and, and uh, what the Enlightenment has done for us. Understanding history, psychology, human nature, biology, physics, everything depends on rationality. So from there, I um, tap him for his opinion on a number of big questions. What is consciousness? What about free will and determinism? How does he think about those? And um, to what extent we're rational or irrational in the debate between Daniel Kahneman and Gert Gingerinzer and his idea of bounded rationality. That is, we are rational, but in the right contexts and the wrong context, we're very irrational. That is, as Steve says, are we more like Homer Simpson or Mr. Spock, Alfred E. Newman or John von Neumann? Uh, Then we get into what it means to believe in ghosts and gods and angels and demons and conspiracy theories. When people say, I believe it, what do they mean by that? I mean, do they actually believe it in a literal sense? It's empirically true? Or is it more of a mythological truth? Uh, That is, it represents something else. So he and I use slightly different terms for that. Steve calls them um, the reality world and the mythological world. I call them empirical truths This versus these mythological truths. But whatever you call them, the idea is to try and explain these things based on uh, what people actually really believe to be true or, or just they just kind of take it as true in some other sense. Then we get into some of the tools of rationality and reason and logic and how science works. And then we uh, also dab into a little bit about morality. What's the basis of morality? Can we have a, a drill down and find a scientific basis for deriving an ought from an is? Uh, I think we can. And as you'll hear, Steve makes a pretty good case for this as well. And then we end by talking about how to talk to irrational people. That is, at Thanksgiving dinner when crazy Uncle Harry floats the idea of the rigged election or QAnon, what do you say? All right. This was a great conversation, one of the best I've had. Steve is such a good guy and one of the smartest people I've ever met. And I've met a lot of really smart people. Uh, So enjoy this conversation. If you do, support the podcast, please, through skeptic.com. Uh, slash donate. That is, you go to skeptic.com slash donate, and you can make a tax-deductible donation to the Skeptic Society. All right, thanks for listening. Here is Steven Pinker. Steven Pinker, thanks for coming on the show. Hey, Michael, thanks for having me. (laughs) In our our home studio, (laughs) as it were. (laughs) Now it's nice. So, as you can see next to me, I have your new book, Rationality. I would have already given it a proper introduction. But before we get into that, as you can see, I have this massive pile of books here. (laughs) How the Mind Works, The Blank Slate, The Better Angels of Our Nature, The Stuff of Thought, Enlightenment. Now, that's only maybe half of your books. So, with the the idea of the... um, Hindsight bias and the self-serving bias. When you started off 25, 30 years ago writing books, 
what was, is there a through line through all these works that you thought of ahead of time or, or is it kind of a contingent pathway that unfolds as, as you develop your ideas? Uh, well, one, one thing leads to another. So there is a, I mean, in, in retrospect, there's a, a through path where um, the, each book contained the seed of the following one. And I got into psychology in the first place when I was an undergraduate, just because it seemed of all of the uh, uh, disciplines in academia, it seemed to have the right combination of the interest in deep issues concerning human nature, uh, but it seemed kind of tractable. That is, you could hmm. answer questions by gathering data about human behavior. But it was uh, kind of big issues that uh, that interest me. I was a, as a Undergraduate, I read works of Noam Chomsky, who hmm. later became my colleague at MIT, but was featured in a, in a New York Times article in the early 1970s. And he combined pretty technical analyses of the syntax of English with questions that go back to the age of reason and the enlightenment about what, what's human nature? How does the mind work? Mm -hmm. Now, you, you can't get do a PhD in how the mind works. <laughs> you can't get a grant to study you know, human nature. Uh, you you got to be a little more specific. Yeah. <clears throat> so for a lot of my career, I did focus on, on some areas in cognitive psychology, uh, visual imagery, visual attention, language acquisition in children. I wrote two pretty technical books on language acquisition, not, not sold in stores. Mm. Um, mm. And then I decided to try my hand at a more a book with a wider audience, The Language Instinct, mm. kind of everything you always wanted to know about language. Partly because I uh, realized that Everyone's interested in language. There were popular books in, in other sciences on you know, dinosaurs and black holes and yeah. uh, you know, medicine, but you know, but nothing on language. And so I, I uh, wrote it. And to cover a field as sprawling as language, everything from the history of languages to who decides what's proper grammar to how do kids acquire it, where do words come from. I needed a, a coherent theory, and, and uh, the one that I advanced was that language is a biological adaptation, like our other adaptations, uh, to uh, share our ideas, to communicate. And, and I stole that idea, of course, from Charles Darwin, who wrote, man has an instinctive tendency to speak, as we see in the babble of our young children, while no child has an instinctive tendency to bake, brew, or write. <laughs> and that just nailed it, yeah. and so I called it the language instinct. Nice. Uh, my final chapter was um, a speculation. If Language is an instinct. What are the other instincts? And there I drew on my interest in, in just psychology in general, including evolutionary psychology. And um, that led to how the mind works, which was uh, how does the rest of the mind, other than language, work in memory, emotion, visual perception, um, concept formation, social relations. Uh, and that book uh, aroused a reaction that I... I knew that human nature is and always has been a controversial subject. It's one with political implications, gets people exercised, uh, people attach all kinds of moral meanings to it. And so a lot of the reaction to how the mind works wasn't so much to my explanation of how stereoscopic vision works, but to the very idea that the mind is a product of natural selection, that, uh, that it's composed of systems that... Um, uh, kind of wired into the brain to that helped our ancestors survive. And it turns out the idea that there is such a thing as human nature, that we're not blank slates written on by the environment, turned out to be, I shouldn't say surprisingly contentious, but c continued to be contentious. <clears throat> and uh, I decided that so much of the reaction to how the mind works was not about the content of the book, but the larger question of what is is there such a thing as human nature? Mm. And I decided to address that in a book. That was the blank slate. Yeah. Uh, the, the Modern Denial of Human Nature was its subtitle, where I tried to take on why it's such a politically fraught and emotionally contentious subject. The One of the reasons is that traditionally, the idea of human nature is, has a bit of a conservative odor, mm -hmm. uh, like you can't change human nature. Mm -hmm. And so your dreams of... a uh, progressive utopia are hopelessly romantic. And because we've got all these nasty and brutish instincts, you're always going to need you know, police and the army and, um, and incentives because people you know, aren't perfectly generous. So you need a market economy that incentivizes them. A lot of uh, ideas that just in the landscape tend to kind of le lean right. But um, I noted in the book, especially in the chapter called Politics, there has always been a um, hereditarian or Dar Darwinian left 
And again, my, my former colleague Noam Chomsky is an example. He's as hard left as you can get, and he was, was the advocate of an innate language faculty. Um, and and in, in, in support of the idea that you can be a progressive in the sense of believing in progress, we can make things better. We're not doomed to the current levels of war and violence that we see around us, even if you do believe in human nature. I noted that, uh, at least in my conception of human nature, it's a multi-part system. It's, 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 it's modular or it's complex or there are multiple intelligences, multiple faculties, domain specificity, it goes by various names. Uh, so some parts of human nature can tug uh, others. So even if we do have some, you know, some kind of ugly instincts like dominance and revenge, but, you know, we also have empathy and self-control. And so what happens just depends on the, uh, the interplay between these different parts of the mind. And I, I threw off almost as an aside, you know, it can't be a debate as to whether it's possible to change society. Societies change. That's, like his, that's what history is. Mm -hmm. And sometimes for the better, such as the abolition of slavery and the fall of the Soviet empire and um, the decline of uh, a, a, a factoid that I had come across, the decline of homicide since the Middle Ages, fallen by a factor of about 30 in, in Europe. And I reiterated those observations in a blog contribution that I was asked mm. to, to submit on edge.org. When every year John Brockman poses a question, I think you've answered them yep. on occasion. And one year is, what are you optimistic about? So I kind of uh, recycled those observations in the blank slate. Well, look, you know, a lot of things have, in a lot of ways, we're less violent than we were 75, 100, 1,000 years ago. And uh, when I, when I um, posted it and then turned it into an article in the New Republic and, and a TED Talk, I then was the recipient of emails from scholars in various disciplines who said, you know, you could have added other examples of historical declines of violence. Did you know, which I did not, <laughs> that since 1945 there's been a huge decline in war, rate, uh, that countries don't go to war as much as, mm. as they used to. Yeah. Someone else said, did you know that uh, violence against women is down, that there are, that rates of rape and sexual assault have fallen? Someone else said, oh, you know, that, that uh, parents don't beat at their children as much as they used to. And someone else said, well, it isn't just those data you cite about fall of homicide in England. Well, it's also true of Germany and Italy and Scandinavia and the Netherlands. And so I was kind of sitting on all these data from all of these scholars in different fields that all kind of point to a conclusion that strikes most people as uh, incredible. Yeah. You read the news, you think violence yeah. is as prevalent as ever. It turned out it's really been in decline in all these different ways. And I thought, I'm in a unique situation, just fortuitously being the uh, possessor of these different um, uh, data sets. Uh, they should be put between a, a single pair of book covers. And as a psychologist, what a, a, uh, uh, what a d delicious topic to try to explain. How could it be possible that both our ancestors were violent and were less so? What, what went right? And that became the better angels of our nature. Nice. That then, um, having presented uh, 75 graphs that kind of look like this, of violence going down, uh, I uh, became aware that it isn't just violence where our species seems to have, have done better, but in uh, education, in longevity, in child mortality, in leisure time, uh, in, in um, uh, accident rates. I was uh, uh, shopping for a new car. And so I bought Car and Driver magazine, and I just happened to, there was an article there with a graph that went like that on um, traffic deaths per passenger mile. Mm. So the, uh, by, by a factor of more than 10, you're way safer driving. I, I didn't know this. Um, so things, good things can happen. And then the question is, why? Um, how about if we remind people of this fact that they are largely ignorant of and tie it together. And that led to enlightenment now, the, um, uh, the case for reason, science, humanism, and progress, where um, putting it together, what could have made all these things go kind of in a good direction? Well, it, probably, it doesn't happen by, by magic. Uh, <laughs> the universe doesn't try to make us better. The universe kind of tries to grind us down. Um, so how could all these things have gotten better? Well, really the only plausible explanation is uh, we are a species with these cognitive 
processes with language. We can pool our discoveries. We can criticize each other's ideas and out of a, the, the collective, a, um, uh, we can discover ways of making ourselves better, of fighting disease and uh, famine and, and war and crime. And it, it shouldn't be a shock that every once in a while one of these ideas works. And if we remember the ones that work and decide not to re repeat our mistakes, that's how progress happens. Yeah. So uh, then finally, the um, skipping a couple of books on the way, yeah. but uh, my most recent book on rationality expands the defense of reason, which was one part of enlightenment now, but also but tries to present the to a lot of the tools of rationality, um, logic, critical thinking, correlation and causation, signal detection theory, Bayesian reasoning. They're kind of benchmarks for what rationality you know, ought to be, uh, leading to the psychological question, how well do we do as a species? And then the inevitable question, and this of course brought me uh, not for the first time, smack into your territory mm -hmm. of, uh, of weird beliefs. Yeah. But of course, we also overlapped in the moral arc, which uh, uh, also uh, addressed some of these forms of uh, improvement over the centuries and millennia. You just got a total summary of all of Stephen Pigger's books, but you still got to read them. <laughs> There's some details in there. And I left a couple of books out. <laughs> That's right, you left a couple of books out. Well, I guess one through line I see is, um, I think you call this universal realism. Is that what you call it? Or so, something like that? You know, uh, yeah, it's something I, I kind of came across and, and named in, in rationality. So the idea is that there's really nothing we should not be able to reason our way or scientifically test any ideas, which does go against a lot of even our colleagues who are, uh, you know, in favor of reason and science, and they'll say, like Steve Gould, NOMA, non-overlapping magisteria. We got to leave religion alone. Science has nothing to say about these ultimate questions of meaning and, and purpose. Or David Hume's is ought fallacy, which I think is itself kind of a fallacy, but that, you know, you can't derive an ought from an is. Therefore, science has nothing to say about morality. There's these kind of barriers that are up there that you've seen, I don't know if you've knocked them down deliberately or just gone around them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I try to do a little bit of the same, but you know, I, I do get pushed back, not, not really from conservatives and Christians, but from liberals that say, you yes, know, you can't absolutely. do that. Absolutely, that's exactly. You know, and this is one of the manifestations of this division, just to take a step back. So universal realism, the term that I gave just uh, realism, not in the sense of being you know, practical, but realism in the philosophical sense of believing that there is a real world, yeah. that propositions are objectively true or false. I mean, we can never be certain that they are, but you know, we, we, we do our best, and, but with a conviction that they really are true or false at the end of the day. Uh, but for a lot of, and this, again, this, this is, <clears throat> these are themes that, that, that you have uh, often written about. When it comes to some of these, as you call weird beliefs, you know, the paranormal, the conspiracy theories, the, the, the medical quackery, the question of why do people believe them? Well, part of the answer is it depends what you mean by belief. Right. Not to get Clinton-esque on this, <laughs> but um, it's not clear how deep these beliefs go in terms of uh, conviction that they are true or false. In the same sense, we have a conviction either there's milk in the fridge or there isn't. Um, uh, the universal realism is the conviction, which we, I, I kind of uh, date to the Enlightenment, that all of your beliefs uh, are like, you know, is there milk in the fridge? They're true or false. You may not know the answer, but you could know the answer yeah. if you try hard enough. And if you tap into communities like scientists and journalists and record keepers. Um, now, that is a deeply, that itself is kind of a weird belief in the context of human history. Namely, you know, I think, we, you know, we believe it. But for a lot of people, there's this whole zone of beliefs where it's like, yeah, true, false, it's kind of like the wrong question. It's like they're empowering, they're uplifting, they're entertaining, mm -hmm. um, such as the existence of God. And I know that you have faced pushback like a number of the uh, 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 atheist authors, not from you know, Bible-thumping right. you know, evangelists, of which you know, you're familiar with them too, but uh, our friends, journalists and professors and pundits who don't say, well, actually, God does exist. And here's, you know, 36 reasons right, to believe they exist. Right, yeah. Rather, it's kind of just, you know, uncouth or not done right. to ask the question, does God exist? Right. It's like, it's a good belief, okay? And what else do you want? Right. And if you realize that that's another mode of belief, it's like a good thing to believe. It could, maybe it's true. 
It's good if everyone believes it's true. Is it really true? You can't find out. Uh, so does God exist as an example? Yeah. I suspect that, and again, this is this is more more in your uh, area, that a lot, at least some conspiracy yeah. theory belief holders, it's not like they're absolutely sure that it's true, but it's um, you know whether the Democrats uh, have a, a cabal of Satan worshiping cannibalistic pedophiles. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's the kind of thing they could do. <laughs> right. You know, do they or not? I, I Well, I'm going to believe it. It's mythically true. It's mythically true, exactly. Politically true, or it's what we believe about the other side that we don't like. Something it, like that. Exactly. Now, so you take someone like, you know, Jerry Coyne has this phrase, you know, faithiest. Faithiest, yes. So these are atheists who recognize that faith is important to people, and they, okay, we're not going to we're not gonna take that away from them. But, you know, it's it's really kind of a condescending way to treat people's beliefs because I've tried this on believers. Like, so if I tell you that, you know, that's your mythic truth, your religious truth, it's not something you can prove. And I'm willing to just let you believe that because I know it makes you feel better. That sounds kind of patronizing, right? Like we smart people know that this is bullshit, but the little people need it. The teeming masses. Yeah, the teeming masses. Now, and, now granted, I mean, there are occasions, you know, if you're a human being and you have compassion, you know, you don't, you try to ram every right. belief down everyone's throats all the time. Just to give an example, so the, the woman that we hired to, to uh, clean our house had this uh, woman of a life, life of hardship, including on top of all of her hardships was the fact that her sister and her sister's grand, grandchildren were killed in a car crash. Oh God! And uh, yeah, I mean, really heart wrenching. And she said, "Well, my only consolation is that uh, we'll all be reunited in heaven." Right. Now, I'm not going to say her. No. Well, actually, there's no ev- <laughs> there's right. no evidence to believe right. that heaven exists. I mean, that would just be yes. cruel. Yeah. And you know, we're not cruel. Um, but when it comes in the, in the public sphere, in arguments that you make, where everyone kind of joins the game, saying, "Well, we're all in it to find out what's what, what is true, what's false, what's good to believe, what isn't," you know, that that's where uh, you know the anything goes, or at least anything that is plausible, rational, in the direction of truth. Yeah, I had Stephen Meyer on the podcast. He has a book called The Return of the God Hypothesis. Basically, it's kind of the the latest version of intelligent design in various realms, physics, cosmology, biology, and so on. So I floated the idea, you know, this faithism, you know, that's your belief, and it's okay that you believe that. He he found that kind of insulting, like, no, no, I believe it because it's it's actually true. Here's the arguments. Here's the evidence. Come on. Well, you got to give him credit yeah. for that, in, in a way. I mean, so, you know, he has these beliefs in the reality zone. Now, again, it's not always, there is something to be thankful for that some beliefs people kind of park in the mythology zone. Like, you know, it used to be that if you were a committed Christian and you believe that if you don't accept Jesus as your savior, you'll spend eternity in hell and in eternal torment. Then, you know, if you really take that seriously, it's kind of rational to try to convert Jews right. at sword point. You're kind of doing them a favor. Right. And it's kind of a public health measure. They shouldn't Just condemn other people. Save their souls. So there's this kind of a, yeah, I mean, there's kind of a perverse rationality in at least them taking their beliefs seriously. On the other hand, it's probably good that nowadays most Christians don't. It's like, yeah, they, you know, if they consider themselves Christian, they do have to believe that, but they don't act as if they really believe in it. Right. Thank goodness. Yes, that, that's right. On the other hand, you had somebody like uh, Ken Miller, who we know, who was really one of the leading debunkers of intelligent design creationism. Uh, and he wrote that book uh, about, you know, why... Darwin's God. Finding Darwin's God. And, but the last chapter is, you know, and by the way, I'm a Catholic, and I accept Jesus as my Savior, and I believe he was resurrected and so on. Anyway, Ken and, and, um, and, and uh, Richard Dawkins and I were all at a conference together. I've told this story on the podcast many times, so sorry for the repetition. Uh, but um, so Richard, as he's wont to do, says, okay, Ken, let's say we found a piece of the true cross you know, and, 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 was, and it was real. And we found on there some, some flesh in the wood. We were able to extract the DNA oh. from, the, from the flesh. And, you know, of course, Ken could see where this was going. He's like, Richard, Richard, you know, does he have a full complement of DNA or is it because born of a, of, a, of a virgin and <laughs> God is the father, so the DNA can't be... Yeah, uh, so, but Ken's like dip, just, does he have a diploid genome? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yes. So Ken's like, Richard, Richard, Richard. Uh, I'm not claiming this is true in some kind of biological sense or scientific sense. This is what I, I'm a Catholic. It's what I believe. It's my faith. I, I mean, that's a great example. Actually, I had not heard that story before, but it's a great example of how belief 
uh, does not necessarily mean your conviction that something is uh, true or provably true. It's things that are empowering, that give your life meaning. Uh, and, you know, a lot of these weird beliefs, I suspect, are in that zone. They're not all. I mean, there were, you know, among the, the QAnon people, there were those who, you know, stormed the Capitol, um, believing that the election had been stolen by this right. um, Democrats who were, who were capable of anything. Uh, there was the, the Comet uh, Ping Pong Pizza Redeemer, Pizzeria Redeemer, who burst in with his guns blazing to save to yeah. save the children. Yeah. Uh, and then you know, found there's no basement, there were no children being right. raped in the basement. Right. And he actually recanted, I believe. He did, yeah. He, he went took, to jail and, and then recanted. But he took his beliefs literally, yeah, right. whereas probably, I don't know what the percentage is, but some portion of QAnon believers is like, well, the Democrats are capable of it. Whether or not right. they did it, what right. difference does it make? This is what always bothers me about the self-report data and surveys. You know, it's 33% of Americans tick the box that UFOs are real or ghosts are real or whatever. Do they really think it through or they're just kind of like, I don't know, seems plausible. I think I heard something on the, uh, the, you know, the, the History Channel or the... Uh... Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, if you sat down Ted Cruz and said, do you really think that there's a secret satanic pedophile ring at this pizza? Really? He's got to say, well, no, of course not. You know, he's not a dummy. So Try to squirm out of having yeah, to answer yeah, the question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no comment. <laughs> yeah, right. or, or like Trump, you know. I'm not a historian. They, not they, a... they like me and I like that, you know, something like that. Right. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's one counter I use to the arguments like, you know, no, the, these things are actually true. Like here's the six best arguments for the resurrection of Jesus. You know, the women went there at the tomb and they saw the the... the the ent entryway had been rolled away and there was a missing body. And then Thomas saw him and, and then the, you know, the vision of the 500 saw Jesus. They go through all these arguments. So, and so to which I say, okay, before we go into each of these one by one, if the arguments you're making are like a scientific argument, like here's the six reasons that we know global warming is real and human cause. And if you look at the data, you'd agree with me, right? So if you presented this to Jews, why don't they accept Jesus as the Savior? They believe in the same God as you, same book, at least the Old Testament, you know, and they even believe that there's going to be a Messiah. They just don't think it was the wasn't, carpenter from wasn't Nazareth, Yeshua, yes. right? It, because the Old Testament prophets apparently said it would not be a meek and mild Messiah like Jesus was. It would be more like a warrior. And so the Jews are still waiting. So if these arguments are so good, how come these rabbis don't go, oh, yeah, this you can't say about rabbis, they just don't get the arguments. If they understood the arguments, they'd change their mind. You can't say that about them. So why don't they convert? And was there an answer? The, I, uh, the only answer I guess, well, I don't know. You know, the, the, the Jews are different. And, and OK, how about the Muslims? And you have well, some it, imams. It, or, you know, it is interesting to see the um, pressure of secular morality on religious belief when it works well, that it, the the, the uh, devout Christians that I know, they're, uh, they're, they're, uh, most of them are, are pretty philo-Semitic. They, you know, they saw what happened in the Holocaust yes. and the kind of ugly history of, uh, of uh, Christian anti-Semitism. They want no part of it. Right. But then they're faced with you know, kind of a contradiction. Like, how can it both be true that you have to accept Jesus as your Messiah right. and there are all these people who don't and, you know, they're okay after all. Yes. Uh, and there are various, you know, twists and turns. Well, there are different, God had different ways of... Right revealing himself to different peoples and, you know, more than one of those is okay. And uh, so you don't have, uh, you know, the Jesus option is one that Christians are obliged to accept. But if you're Jewish, you find your other way of accepting it through the Torah and the, the Talmud. So they do, you know, twist themselves to accommodate this rather uncomfortable tension. Right. And again, it's, uh, you know, how much do they, they, they really believe it? Yeah. In a way, some of this mythological belief, this benign hypocrisy is something to be thankful for yes because people can you know and you know people like ken miller and francis call you know, they're, they're, they're good decent people right uh and you know they uh, struggle to make these beliefs coexist and they found a way and you know okay yeah so the question you're i think you're getting at with your search for universal reality is that there are tools to get at it the question is, is, how far can we go? So you and I are willing to go as far as we could go. So, uh, so if we, but if we bump up against things, so we could say like slavery is really wrong, as Lincoln said, if slavery is not wrong, nothing's wrong. You know, the principle of interchangeable perspectives, as I would not want to be a slave, I shall not be a master, Lincoln said. 
And, and so those are sort of the low hanging fruit. You know, we've kind of gotten past those in torture and civil rights, women's rights, gay rights, you know, but, but what if you bump up against something like abortion? What's the right answer? Yeah, no, and there, and there, in cases where there are conflicting values, there, in a sense, there, there is no right answer. Some of it probably in practice is determined by the consequences of different policies mm. uh, and that people, you know, when there's a conflict, people kind of assess the costs and benefits of uh, coming down too hard on one side or another. And if you really consistently believe that a uh, fertilized ovum is a, uh, a person yeah. deserving of all the rights, um, and let's say you also believe in the death penalty, should we execute women who use an intrauterine device mm. that prevents implantation of a fertilized uh, uh, egg? Um, you know, most people aren't willing to live with that implication. Right. And so that kind of pushes them you know, toward the, you know, the, the charitable treatment of women who, for one reason or another, cho choose not to carry a, a fertilized ovum to term. Right. And, and as you show, I think we've been shifting ever forward to bending the moral arc, expanding the moral sphere. Uh, based on certain principles, based on what? Based on that there's a universal human nature. If I see you suffering, or if, and I see the signs in your face that you probably feel the way I feel when I express those emotions, so I know you suffer like I can suffer. Therefore, I should treat you equally. Something like that is not natural. That you know that took centuries, really, to come about. But now we've kind of gotten there. But that's not just cultural relativism. That's not just some kind of crazy Western way of thinking. And uh, I think that, you know, it's a kind of way of reasoning toward a kind of truth that there is a human nature. People don't want to suffer. So how can we do things, uh, have policies that lead to more of that? And there's nothing special about the pronoun I as opposed to you. Right. So that anything you claim for yourself, you can't uh, withhold from someone else and expect them to agree. Namely, it's okay for me to exploit you and you know, let your children drown and uh, but it's not okay if you exploit me and you let my children down. Well, that, you know, you can say that, but no one else right. has to go along with you. Right. They're not going to go along right. with you. Plus the, 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 the kind of game theoretic analysis that a world in which we refrain from hurting each other, which imposes a, a, inflicts a, a high cost with a much smaller benefit on the uh, harmer, um, that there are many, many opportunities where we can boost the well-being of someone else at a relatively small cost to ourself. Yeah. So if we sign on to a kind of universalist morality of universal benevolence and non-harm, non-violence, everyone's better off. Uh, yeah. Now, granted, I could be better off still if I was the exploiter and if I knew I was always going to be the exploiter. But given that, you know, uh, I really do, I'm not that powerful, no one's that powerful, I do depend, my well-being depends on what you do, I'm going to uh, agree to a universal moral code in which neither of us gets to harm the other one. It's better than, uh, in, in the long run, than me being, being a psychopath who can do whatever I want to you. How do you respond to the typical pushback I get? Like, well, well, what if you found a society where people love slavery? Even the slaves said, yeah, this is pretty good. Or well, somebody says, I like suffering. What, you know, why should your concern about my suffering be a moral value? This is, uh, I'm different than you. Like, I think it was uh, George Bernard Shaw who said, um, you shouldn't uh, do unto others as they uh, have, uh, would have you do unto them. They may have different tastes. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> well, I mean, there is, you know, uh, it's quite a counterfactual that people would enjoy being slaves. And yeah. you know, if they were to, um, the difference, but, you know, if they were to enter a contract in which they got certain perks and they performed certain services, you know, that's fine. That's kind of what employment is. The difference is you can't have the state enforce that the, the contract if it included their being unable to get out of it. Mm, right. So ultimately, when we're talking about what people choose in terms of their own pleasure, their own well-being, it all starts with, well, yeah, but you got to choose. And the thing with slavery is you don't get to choose. And so a difference between a uh, kind of a benevolent uh, you know, patriarch or paternalistic figure who provides for you and you serve at his behest is okay as, as long as it doesn't go to the point where you're locked into it, and if you change your mind, you can't get out. And the, the right. government enforces the uh, your, your your owner's 
uh, right to keep you that way. Is it enough to say that you have to start a moral argument somewhere? So we're going to start with human flourishing as our goal. I'm not going to make any claims that that's absolutely true. I'm just starting there and I'm going to build from there. And then everything you just said would fall from there. But can we do better than that? Can we say, actually, human flourishing is based in our our nature. This is what we want to do because, as you said, the second law of thermodynamics is always pushing against us and living forms want to live. This is, you know, I mean, with the exceptions of severe depression, so people commit suicide or whatever, but, but just by nature, you know, we want to survive. Why? Maybe that's one thought too many. Why? Why? It, this is what we do. Yeah. That's what living organisms do. They live. Well, and it, it does get back to the, um, Hume's uh, argument that you yeah. alluded to earlier in a conversation that you can't get an ought from an is, and that is technically on very narrow grounds true, in the same sense that another thing that, that Hume claimed in that discussion, that there's it, it, you uh, can't rationally, there's no rational argument why anyone should choose their own happiness and comfort and well-being to uh, you know, pain and, and, and suffering. Mm -hmm. Well, again, that's technically true too. Mm -hmm. uh, However, it is a fact about us that we prefer to be uh, comfortable and, and well-fed and happy. Uh, it's a fact about all of us. And uh, one, once you concede that non-logical fact, uh, other things follow. Yeah. Uh, such as, the indeed, I could be, as, as Hume put it in his example, I could be indifferent between a, um, say, accepting a scratch of my little finger if it were to prevent a, a huge genocide. Um, you know, logically, there's nothing that compels you to say, okay, scratch my finger and we'll save 100 million people. Right. But generally, because, you know, with that kind of situation, you could be one of those 100 million. Right. Uh, you would certainly like it if someone else accepted the scratch on their finger. And so to be consistent, you would have to, um, you know, make that, that, that moral commitment, that moral sacrifice. And that's how, even though, you know, you, you shouldn't argue against Hume, he was a really smart guy. Yes. <laughs> and he was yes. technically accurate. But it only goes so far. And, I think and, philosophers call those thin arguments, right? It's a thin argument versus yeah, a thick argument, something right. like that. So like in reading Better Angels of Our Nature and the Decline of War, for example, here's another way to, to, to phrase the, the, the question. If we know the causes of the decline of war it, the way it is, you know, democracy, trade, membership in international organizations all cause uh, international conflict to decline. If we know that's the way it is, then we ought to do that. We ought to do more of that. So that is deriving an ought from an is. Yes, it, you know, again, always relative to the goal. We want. We think war is a bad thing because war is not healthy for children and other living things. Right. Uh, you know, war. What is it good for? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> right. Uh, if we are committed to that, yeah, then indeed we should learn as much as we can from history, qualitative, uh, quantitative, political science, international relations, and try to do more of whatever it is that we think drove war down in the first place. But it is a, um, you know, that kind of humanism of war is not healthy for children and other living things is itself a 20th century phenomenon, mm -hmm. because in fact, uh, is a post-World War I phenomenon, because before World War I, you know, John Mueller has mm -hmm. uncovered uh, you know, dozens of quotes by philosophers and artists and statesmen and poets saying war is great. War is the best thing that there ever was. It's manly and heroic and holy and spiritual and thrilling and peace. Oh my God, there's nothing worse than peace. It's consumerist and effeminate and selfish and cowardly. <laughs> uh, now it's, this strikes us as barking bad today, Yeah. but, uh, but it was probably a, a consensus opinion. Until then, World War One happened, and it's like, whoops, you know, 15 million dead, and you know, young men, you know, machine gunned down as they emerged from trenches, uh, poison gas. Like, well, maybe we should rethink this war as yeah. holy and, and spiritual and thrilling uh, business. Even you know, one of my heroes, William James, in his the namesake of the building that I work in, had a, a, a beautiful essay called uh, the, "The Moral Equivalent of War." Mm. Um, Jimmy Carter cited it, and then they they, they uh, uh, called it the the meow speech, <laughs> moral equivalent of war. M E O W. That's funny. Uh, but think of the James, who was you know, himself was a thoroughly humane man. You might think the war moral equivalent of war 
uh, would refer to something that's as bad as war. Mm. But James, in the context of the time, this is around 1910 or so, it was something that would be as good as war. That's what he had to deal with because that was the consensus around him at the time that war was a good thing. It was self-sacrifice. It was heroism. It was um, uh, uh, submerging yourself in a higher cause. Mm. And James's argument was, well, let's see if we can get all the advantages of war without the disadvantages like you know, hundreds of thousands of people getting killed. So he said we should send off our young uh, men and women to fishing boats and coal mines and farms and factories where they would get the childishness beaten out of them. So they would develop the heroism, the toughness, mm. the self-sacrifice, the stoicism without them actually having to kill people. Right. So that was the more, it was kind of a predecessor of the Peace Corps and Teach right. for America. And, right. um, uh, but you know, what we had to realize in, in, in the historical context that by moral equivalent of war, he wanted to come up with something that was in the eyes of the people of his era as good as war. Right, interesting. Yes, well, so the question is, is have we discovered something about reality in our current values that we hold about why the decline of war is good? Civil rights, women's rights, gay rights, and so on and so forth. Uh, or could this all turn around in centuries from now and then philosophers would say, well, that was just a temporary Western culture yeah. way of thinking. Yeah, pendulum swings. They didn't, and... they didn't discover anything about human nature and truth and reality. That was just a Western way of thinking in the 20th and 21st century. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's possible. You know, the, the, the hemlines go up and the hemlines go down and, you know, men's ties get wider and skinnier and, you know, slavery comes in, slavery goes out. It, it looks like history doesn't work that way. Yeah. I mean, bad things can reappear. After the, uh, um, the the French abolished slavery after the French Revolution, Napoleon reintroduced it. Mm. So, you know, bad things can un un unquestionably come back. But still, overall, again, this is a theme that, that of course, you, you explored in the moral arc. But you, you do see some directionality that some things once abolished kind of stay abolished. Yeah, uh, Human sacrifice might be the prototypical case, where every civilization practiced it, ancient right. civilization. You throw the virgin into the volcano. You you cut the, the, the heart out, the beating heart out of a, a living a victim to propitiate the gods, to kind of slake their thirst for blood, you know, better him than me. Uh, maybe, maybe God will be satisfied and he'll leave us alone. And, you know, countries don't do that anymore. For all the horrible things that countries do, they don't do that. Or, you know, another example, maybe a little, little more trivial, but taking out the family for uh, Sunday afternoon entertainment of laughing at the insane in an insane oh, asylum right. at their antics. I mean, that was just a family fun in the 19th century. Have you I seen don't... those pictures of the, like, 1910s of the um, uh, of a lynching? I got a yeah. Sunday afternoon and the people are all dressed up in their Sunday go to meet clothes. And, and, or, a, or an execution, a more right. orderly execution. The last right. one, I think, was in Kansas in the 1930s. Right. Um, so they, they probably aren't coming back. Now, you know, we could be proven right or wrong, but, you know, a lot of things do kind of stay abolished, suggesting that it isn't, isn't like the hemlines. But, uh, but what I'm getting at is something like how we say, well, Darwin discovered natural selection as the driving force of evolution. That's not going to happen again. It's been found. It's been discovered. Einstein discovered, uh, you know, the relativity and so on. That can't be discovered again. That's reality. Could we say something like, human flourishing, we discovered that yeah. this is a better way, not just a more practical way to live, but an actual truth about human nature. Are there moral truths? Are there moral truths? Yeah, so yeah. philosophers call it moral realism. Yeah. And again, realism not in the sense of, you know, kind of sensible, pragmatic, but realism in the sense of real. That is moral truths, as you say, just like relativity and, and natural selection, uh, the people who uh, didn't believe them were incorrect, and the people who believe them were correct, uh, yeah. as it turns out. It's, you know, it's a harder thing to show, but there, there has been an argument, I don't know, I don't think it's philosopher proof, uh, although it was advanced by a philosopher, that the, the directionality of history that, uh, that we're talking about, or the apparent directionality, uh, you know, again, th that both of us have written about, uh, is a kind of, at least an indirect argument for moral realism, namely just as in science, when some things are discovered, they tend to stay discovered. You know, it's probably, probably right. we'll go back to thinking that hereditary material is in protein as opposed to DNA. Um, that the fact that there some barbaric pro practices are 
one society abolishes them, then the whole world does, and it doesn't go backward, is a kind of roundabout way of saying, well, maybe these really are true. Now, some other philosophers attack that, yeah. the soundness of that argument, but it is one kind of uh, way to defend this. Uh, another would be to look at the n inherent nature of the argument itself uh, for, for uh, say, universal rights in terms of the logical uh, irrelevance of the distinction between me and you. But it's, it's a hard thing to, it's a hard thing yes. to prove. I mean, with it, among philo moral philosophers, some of them are moral realists and, and many not so, or not so much. I mean, I'd like to be able to say, we discovered in the 21st century that gays like to be married as much as straights. Yeah. We discovered the same sex marriage is perfectly okay. I mean, we did. Could you make an argument uh, maybe not philosophically, but scientifically in this sense of, yeah, that's because they have the same nature as everybody else. They want to be, they want to have love and commitment and so on. They want the public recognition that straights want for marriage. We sh they should have that because we've discovered that about them. Something well, like there's that. that there's, there's an, a whole other set of arguments. We, we kind of um, uh, glanced off them earlier in the conversation of, since some moral arguments or a lot of moral arguments hinge on the totality of benefits and harms, which are empirical questions, you know, what will happen if you institute a certain policy, then when you do implement a policy or you compare societies that have different policies and you say, well, what happens? Um, that kind of empirical data can feed back on the idea that something is immoral because it'll inevitably lead to such and such. It'll there'll be a slippery slope. Yeah. So abortion is an example where you know, before Roe v. Wade, um, and you, know, you and I remember where there were arguments that if you legalize abortion, soon you'll legalize infanticide. Right. And, uh, or you'll devalue the interests of children. Children will be seen as com commodities, inconveniences, burdens, and, and you'll have more and more callous treatment of children. So we can say, okay, well, it's been you know, almost 40 years since Roe v. Wade. What's happened? Has any state tried to legalize infanticide? The answer is no. Uh, has our society become more callous toward children? Well, no, we're in the, uh, the we're living the era of helicopter parenting <laughs> right. and uh, hyper parenting. And, yeah. uh, so it's a kind of, even though it's not a direct moral argument, in a, insofar as part of the moral argument was what it would lead to, we can say, well, the data are in and we know the answer is no. In the case of gay marriage, again, this is you know, more recent, you know, 2015, um, but there were arguments at the time, and, and you don't have to be as old as us to remember them, that if you legalize gay marriage, the next thing, people will be able to marry their pets, they'll be able to we'll have polygamy, right. uh, you know, they'll marry their farm animals, uh, and you know, these were serious arguments at the time. Yeah. I mean, maybe, I can't believe it. You know, we're, we're still gathering data. It's been six years and yeah. you know, probably not. That's probably not, no. Yeah. And then let's see how far we can go with this. So let's say, what's the right tax rate, income tax or tariffs or whatever, or what's the right immigration policy? Mm. Now, it'd be easy to say, well, there is, science has nothing to say about that. But on the other hand, Sagan points this out at the end of, of um, the demon haunted world that like say in the United States, we have 50 different states and they all have different constitutions. They all have gun control, different gun control laws and tax rates and so forth. And those are like mini experiments and we can kind of see what the outcome is. You know, you, you nudge this one up and then this goes down or this goes up, whatever it is you're trying to measure. And then, so like Enlightenment Now, you show that pretty much all European countries in the United States and Canada have about 20% of their GDP allocated for social services and, and, and whatnot. And despite the hue and cry on both sides, it's not enough, it's too much. It's always pretty much the same. Uh, and that's kind of unfolded over the last century or so. You know, Bismarck's, uh, you know, German state was kind of the first to implement a welfare system and so on. It's kind of spread. And I'm wondering, is, is that because we're discovering that, you know, the society has to have a, some kind of safety net? Because we can't all live a you know a decent life with homeless people right outside our doors or whatever. So you know we have not just a moral obligation that we're discovering something about the proper structure of a of a society. So therefore, you have to have some kind of tax rate to pay for it, and therefore we can at least reason our way to an answer to like what's the right tax rate, income tax rate, as opposed to being just completely relative or willy nilly. 
No, it's an interesting argument, and it's it's not. I think it's not played out as much as it should be. You know, you and I both have friends in the libertarian movement, are sympathetic to some libertarian ideas. You know, they're not card carrying libertarians. Yeah. But the you know one limitation of libertarianism is that um, the ideal libertarian state you know doesn't exist, never existed. That is a <laughs> right. affluent democracy with no social safety net, no regulation. Now. Liberta some libertarians would say, well, it's just, you know, we've been too cowardly to try out. And if we, any country did, they'd be so much more desirable than, than anyone that exists that we'd all slap ourselves in the forehead right. and say, why didn't we try that earlier? Well, maybe. But that's what Marxists say. Well, and that's what Marxists say. That's true, that there hasn't been a true, you know, never been a true Marxist society, there's never been a true libertarian society. Right. Maybe, but we could, as you say, kind of look at history, look at comparisons among uh, states as a, a kind of laboratory, and the fact that every Western democracy has seen fit to introduce a welfare state, uh, ending up in a fairly narrow band. I mean, you mm. know, France does much more social spending than the United States. Yeah. Um, but only a few percentage. Well, I think between 20 and 30, I think, is, is okay. more or less the window. Right. So, I mean, you know, there's a little bit there. Um, but you can also then... You know, if you're a good enough econometrician, say, holding all the confounds constant, are there better outcome measures for countries that um, redistribute more? There's one economist that tried to do it, um, Leandro Prado de Escosura, um, hmm. who claimed that there actually there is a U-shaped hmm. relationship between amount of redistribution and uh, measures of, of social well-being. The United States according to this analysis, spends too little. Mm. France probably spends too much. Mm. Uh, the, the data are too noisy for it to be definitive, but I could see that as a, a, probably a better way of establishing some of these debates than, than the one that we have now of just dueling plausibilities. Yeah, right. Pertaining to the, the idea of whether we can um, kind of look at trends in history and cross jurisdiction comparisons to uh, answer some political questions like, is a, a more or less social spending good. Uh, there are uh, trends over time, such as the expansion of the welfare state in every Western democracy through the, uh, at least most of them after the 1930s. Um, you can look at the rationale, like maybe even if you believe that the free market is a good way of generating wealth, there's some things that even in theory, the free market doesn't do so well, right. like providing for people who have nothing to sell in the marketplace. Right. Like, you know, kids, like old people, like sick people, and and others, and you know, we're no longer satisfied to let the little match girl freeze to death, or or you know, right. the, the Jodes buried grandpa by the side of Route sixty six. <laughs> uh, we just decided we're not gonna, we, we can't put up with that. And in, even uh, some, uh, what I think might be a, a new version of this experiment is uh, a little paradox that popped up uh, two years ago when. In Latin America, Chile, which by you know, many measures is a highly successful Latin American society, you know, they're, they're more affluent than their neighbors and the, their democracy has lasted now for about 40 years. But then the, the young people started you know, torching subway stations. You know, mm. why there instead of you know, Bolivia or Venezuela? Yeah. Uh, you know, what are they so peeved about? They're living in a, by Latin American standards, a pretty, pretty good country. And one of the reasons is that, that um, as countries develop, they become more kind of munificent in their social safety net. And Chile has lagged behind. They, uh, they've got richer. Uh -huh. They have not expanded social benefits as much as their, their OECD peers. And it, people get pissed off and they start to torch subway stations if they yeah. don't feel that they're enough of uh, the surplus is kind of redistributed to, to them. Now, whether or not they have a right to do that or not, mm -hmm. but you know, people are people. And there may be some wisdom in... Uh, you know, th throwing enough of a sop to people in redistribution and pensions and, and right. student bursaries, so that they don't uh, uh, you know, they, they don't burn cars. <laughs> right. Well, in another one of these areas where we're bumping up against an epistemological wall, I think maybe conflicting rights. So we're seeing this with uh, trans rights versus women's rights. You know, does a, tra a male to female trans have a right to compete in sports in the female division? 
or going to the female locker room or bathroom or whatever. You know, everybody's going crazy over this issue. You can barely speak about it without people losing their minds. But it's just, a, to me, just a kind of an old-fashioned rights conflict. You know, we have conflicting rights and you can't have everything, right? As Thomas Holt famously said, you know, there are no solutions. They're just trade-offs. You want more of this, you're going to get less of that, you know. So I, uh, I did some gun control debates with John Lott. Remember John Lott, the guy that yes. wrote? More guns, less more guns, less crime, right? He's pretty hardcore on this, okay? And he's got his ducks all lined up in his arguments. And I got, as a libertarian, I was a youthful libertarian. I was, well, gun control, nah, people should have whatever they want. And then I started looking at the, the data and it's like, you know, this is bad. This is like as many people are dying by guns as by automobiles. And we do something about automobile deaths as you noted, uh, why shouldn't we do something about this? So, I mean, you know, we, we restrict our freedoms all the time. I'm not free to drive on any side of the road I want. We have agreed that I'm taking, I'm giving up my freedom to drive on either side of the road for your safety and my safety. And we do this all the time, right? So, but in, in some of the audiences, I noticed it, it really didn't matter how many people died. It's like, this is my second amendment, right? So I said, what if it wasn't 35,000 a year? What if it was 350,000 people died a year? Would, would you be concerned about that? He goes, no, and these, you know, audience was kind of, no, 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 it's I, the, this right trumps the consequences. So it, it's almost like a, uh, a deontological versus consequentialism. It absolutely is. Yes. And some, um, I'm just blanking on the name of the uh, political philosopher who made the argument that libertarianism some com combines both the uh, deontological and consequentialist arguments, usually deontological in the sense that there are certain rights, there are certain liberties that you just may not infringe on. Although often mixed in, there's the consequentialist argument that, well, we'd all be uh, more prosperous if we adopted these policies. Yeah. And that within libertarianism, there is a, a tension between those two rationales. Yes, and, and I find conservatives and Republicans are very inconsistent about this because if it was 35,000 people died a year of terrorist attacks, <laughs> yeah, well, oh no, my God. They no would, great, no the, brainer. The, the Homeland Security tripled the budget, canceled the Constitution completely, except for the Second Amendment. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right. and, uh, and, you know, it's like, okay, so they're just two different problems. People are dying because of this or they're dying because of that. Where's the consistency? Yeah. And you're and, right that there are some trade-offs that are not kind of objectively resolvable. Um, partly they, they hinge on uh, some principles that people might consider sacred. Uh, you just right. can't, you may not trade them off uh, regardless of the cost. And it sounds like that was the case with, with a lot. I think so. Um, and I, I was also thinking about that with George Lakoff's book on moral politics, where he, he kind of made the metaphor of the family as a strict father family or a nurturing mother family. Yeah, except that he, um, you know, being a good Berkeley leftist, he couldn't call it a nurturing mother. It was a nurturing parent. Oh, nurturing. Oh, that's right. You, you don't want to imply that, it's, that <laughs> parenting right. is gendered, even though his, uh, you know, as, as a you know brilliant linguist, which he is, uh, and, and with the the, the methodology, the insight of what does language tell us about human nature, which again, he has pursued brilliantly, you would see in the language that parenting really is gendered, mm, including yes. the word nurture, which comes from the same root as nurse. So oh. it's the difference between, think of the difference between to mother a child and to father a child. <laughs> Oh, they right. are not interchangeable. Right. Uh, so baked into our language, there is the assumption that parenting is something that moms tend to be more involved with right. than dads. But of course, that had to go out the window if you let your politics trump your, your linguistics. Yes. Well, here, you know, I'm thinking you know, conservatives will say, well, I'm in, we're in favor of small government and, uh, you know, keep the government out of people's private lives. Okay, what about the military? Well, except the military and <laughs> right. jails and the court system. Oh, no, we need a massive court. Build a wall, immigration policy. What about freedom of women to make their own? Oh, well, except for the women, you know, all of a sudden. Well, and that is, by the way, and that is potentially a way to find common ground, namely, hmm. uh, if you, now, people who are dead set in their opinions will go to their graves believing what they believe. But for people who are more on the fringes of the, of the, the, the movement, who aren't, may not be true believers, that's the kind of argument that you know peels them off a few at a time, um, mm. or that prevents you know the new babies who are being born every minute from necessarily getting sucked into an ideology. At least it's an answer to a to a frequently asked question of uh, how do you persuade people to change their minds if mm. they have these convictions. And the answer is well, with well, some you can't, but with some you point out, as as you said, uh, the con inherent contradictions in their belief system if. if 
you know, if such are to be found. Yeah, with the abortion issue, I try on uh, t talking to pro-lifers. Um, what's our goal here? The goal is to reduce unwanted pregnancies. The problem is not abortions, it's unwanted pregnancies. Okay, why are women getting pregnant when they don't want to? Okay, here's the reasons and, you know, education, access to birth control, healthcare, economic empowerment, you know, pregnancy, unwanted pregnancy rates go down and therefore abortion should go down. Why aren't you concerned about that? Yeah. If that's your ultimate goal, rather than moralizing about right. it. And, and punishing after the fact as opposed to preventing it in the first place. Right, yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. Uh, you know, so or at, at worst, if, if it's a conservative Christian I'm talking to who's a pro-lifer, I'll say, where's your Christian charity and love and empathy for these women that are poor? Yeah. I mean, but, yeah, right, exactly. Well, they would say, well, what are, where's your empathy for that, you know, the poor embryo or the poor fetus? Well, that's true, you, yes. If yes. you push, though, you know, and I do think something that, that you know, many of our peers don't appreciate is that the, the moral argument against abortion is not, is not trivial. Right, no, no. Uh, because it is a continuum. Well, okay, first trimester, well, you know, why not second trimester? Why not you know, right before birth? Why not right after birth? Because it is a continuum. Right. And so the people who, who say that you can't uh, that casually uh, abort a child in the first trimester, you know, I, I, I disagree with them, but it's not a trifling argument. Yes. And you, you do need reasons, and they're, they're not clear cut like if, if if it's not if it's okay on one day is it okay on the next day and if not what about the next day after that the day after that the day after that and then you do get to infanticide so how do you draw the line and if it's something like um you know viability well why is that so morally relevant doesn't it depend on your technology of keeping kids alive ultimately this is an argument it's kind of a i think an argument a lot of people don't swallow explicitly but i think it's in practice what we do and that is there is no sharp dividing line you know Biology just didn't give us one. Right, right. And so we have to set a boundary somewhere um, in terms of protection of a person qua person such that killing it is murder. Uh, and there is, nature doesn't give us that dividing line. This is me arguing now. Uh, the, the, the first trimester is, you know, it's a pretty good one. It hasn't, it has not slipped toward infanticide. Uh, bringing it back to conception would mean that we would jail women who use an IUD. So, you know, that's not going to work. And pragmatically, this seems to be a line that we can we can all live with. Yeah, right. But even there, where you draw the line, it's not completely arbitrary. There's kind of a logic and some empirical evidence behind it. And we use arguments, by, not just viability, but when the uh, you know consciousness comes online, the fetus can feel pain. You know, we use well, arguments. Yeah, like no, that is morally significant. Although sometimes a line is just um, uh, significant because everyone can see it, hmm. uh, and it has to be drawn somewhere. Let's draw it where everyone uh, kind of agreed that there is a line to be drawn. Like when the, when the Supreme Court voted that you can't, the death penalty can't be applied to people 18 or under because their their brains are not fully developed. They don't have the prefrontal cortex to control their urges. So they, they didn't have the kind of freedom that an adult would have. Therefore, they're morally culpable. So we should not hold them the same level. That's based on neuroscience, right? So there's kind of informed, maybe based, informed by science. Well, it, it informed, except if it was really informed by neuroscience, we would put every a uh, convicted murderer into a, an Brain FMRI scanner. machine and see how, how what their frontal lobe connectivity is. And, you know, we don't do that. No. We do draw a line, though, that is arbitrary. Like, you know, it's not like on your 18th birthday, suddenly your brain changes. Right. But we've got to put it somewhere. Right. And, you know, 18 has kind of become a focal point because we use it for voting and for some other things. Going to war, but not drinking. Well, but not drinking, you know, <laughs> too, and not driving, right. and not marrying. And, I mean, so we, we're kind of, we are kind of all yeah, over the map there. Yeah. But lines have to be drawn, and often if there's one, even if it's somewhat arbitrary, and it could be that viability is, uh, is is arbitrary. But you know, hey, it's a line, and we can all see it, and uh, it's yeah. as good as any other line as a starting point. Actually, uh, Adrian Raines scanned the brains of serial killers. Remember that in his he book did. Anatomy of Violence. But that was not used as evidence in court. No, no, it's just just his argument that. Uh, uh, you know, these guys just have lack of self-control. The, the free, prefrontal cortex is pretty quiet. And so they're succumbing to the urges bubbling up from within. But of course, I don't have those urges bubbling up. Like, oh, if I didn't have my prefrontal cortex, I'd be murdering people right and left. It just never occurs to me to do that. So it's obviously something else going on. But that gets us to this question of free will, which you've hinted at in your books, but you've never like done a head on, I'm a compatibilist or I'm a determinist or I'm a, or this. 
Uh, maybe it's because it's an irresolvable issue. Maybe it's a problem with our concepts of what you mean by volition and determinism or whatever. How, how do you think about that? Yeah, it, it does depend on what you mean. And, and uh, I guess I am a kind of compatibilist in the sense that, you know, I, I think that there's nothing other than brain neurophysiology in determining our choices. Uh, uh, you know, I don't think that every time we make a decision, a miracle occurs in the brain. It's just, it's, it's neural firings. Right. Um, on the other hand, those neural firings are really, really complex. There's probably some random elements in them because neurons are stochastic devices. There's probably some chaos in a technical sense that arbitrarily small initial conditions can lead to divergent outcomes, the, 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 the butterfly causing the, the, the uh, hurricane. So there's no determinism in the strict mathematical sense of given all the inputs, you can predict the output. So that's not true of, of the brain. Mm -hmm. Now, random unpredictability is not the same as free will, although it is a denial of determinism. When we talk about uh, free will, often what we're talking about is holding people responsible. Mm -hmm. And there, I, I get a fair amount of, of uh, email and uh, uh, tortured young people who say, oh, I, I listened to Sam Harris. <laughs> And he yeah, told my me life is over. <laughs> yes. Why would I get there's up in the no, morning? There's no free will. Does yeah. that mean you know we don't have to? We can't. We can't punish you know rapists and murderers and like what am I supposed to believe? Right. Now you can actually have a coherent policy on moral responsibility that does not hinge on um, some kind of miraculous freedom from causation, which is kind of a naive view of free will. Namely, just think of it in terms of incentives and, and deterability. Namely, even if the brain is deterministic in the sense that you know it responds to its prior state, uh, if you have a society where we say, if you murder someone, we'll put you in jail, will the brains of people factor that into their decision-making and lower the probability that they'll kill someone? Yeah. And you know the answer is, is clearly yes. And it's a reason to at least act as if there is the free will, as long as it's not free will in the sense of utter arbitrariness, right. but rather uh, responsiveness to socially announced contingencies of praise, blame, responsibility, culpability, reward, punishment. And there are a lot of the, then a lot of the answers, a lot of the question, the, the, the conundrums uh, work out kind of the same way, whether you believe that it's this right. strange thing called free will or not, such as, do you punish children? Uh, you might say, well, kids don't really have free will. I mean, you could say that, but you could also say, if you punish children, the same number of kids would commit wrongdoing as if you didn't. So it's it, it it's, has nothing but uh, cruelty in it. It doesn't mm. satisfy your goal of reducing wrongdoing. So on with the insanity defense and with you know, holding animals legally culpable, which which a lot of countries used to do. Yes, uh, it's con it was considered humane. Uh, not to do it anymore, not because animals ha have free will uh, or don't have free will, but just because that very policy is not going to be an effective incentive for those agents, those animals, in and result in reducing the frequency of the harmful acts. I like Dan Dennett's degrees of freedom argument. Well, the, uh, and what I just said is, is partly yeah. adapted from Dennett. I think of like in the Middle Ages, there's that story about, you know, the guy killed somebody with an ax and, and he got put to death and the ax was punished. Yes. <laughs> like, <laughs> we don't do that anymore. Uh, right. Because it won't it won't affect what axes do, Right. I, I think. And, and again, I give Dennett uh, credit. I mean, he, he formulated this originally in, in uh, his book Elbow Room. Right. And the... Degree, the kinds of freedom you want, el yeah, elbow room, that was it, yeah. Well, but see, another way to think that I think of it is, of course, we live in a determined universe, but I'm part of the causal net of the universe. I'm changing it as it goes, as the, you know, the kind of unfolding of time from past to future, I'm in that. And I can tweak the variables here and there and, and nudge it this way, or even just nudge myself. So the example I use is, you know, I, kn I know that I like chocolate chip cookies between like four o'clock and seven o'clock. And so I make a point not to be near where they are. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to drive by the Mrs. Fields chocolate chip cookie store at that time. Who is sometimes called the Odyssean self-control. Yes. So, so, but who, but who is, who's doing the Odyssean yeah. selecting? I am. Well, who, who am I? Uh, you can't just say, well, that the self is an illusion. Well, maybe, but it's a good illusion. I feel like 
uh, I'm a person and I'm affecting the future. So in other words, not predeterminism. There's no, I don't think the universe is predetermined. Like I knew you were going to sit down here today at 2.30 and, and we knew this was going to happen at the Big Bang. <laughs> you know, the, the, not just random, you know, stochastic or Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Not too many damn butterflies. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right. So, so, but the other hard question in that is, could you have done otherwise? Yeah. Right. You know, the putt or, you know, the, you, you hit somebody or whatever. And with the example I used, you know, let's, let's say somebody's faithfully married and happily, but on the road, they make a mistake and screw up and they have an affair. The wife finds out, say it's that direction. Cause that's usually how it goes in those stories. And, you know, she's, and then he says, well, honey, I, I, I'm sorry, but I had no control. I mean, this was all predetermined, the big bang and, you know, and makes the kind of arguments that Sam makes, you know, I don't have the control, the kind of control you think I have. It, could he even finish the thought before <laughs> yeah. you better not do it again. You could have done different and, you well, better and, and a partner who behaves in that way, uh, um, publicly, uh, might result in a spouse who is less likely to have strayed in the first place. And that's perfectly determined, oh, perfectly not deterministic in the sense of probability equals one, but it shifts the, the odds according to the way that ph physical processes affect other physical processes. Yeah. And saying, uh, you know, I, I will you know, raise hell, I'll leave you, I'll, be, I'll put you to shame. Uh, right. Those are themselves causes of behavior, at right. least the obviously not after the fact, but if that's what you can anticipate that someone would do, then it is before the fact and it can affect behavior. And that's why responsibility exists, even if we are in some sense determined. So in the new book, chapter one, how rational an animal, I'm going to read the, uh, the initial paragraph here and then give my response to that. Homo sapiens means wise hominin. And in many ways, we have earned the specific epithet of our Linnaean binomial. Our species has dated the origin of the universe, plumbed the nature of matter and energy, decoded the secrets of life, unraveled the circuitry of consciousness, and chronicled our history and diversity. We've applied this knowledge to enhance our own flourishing, blunting the scourges of, that immiserated our ancestors for most of our existence. We have postponed our expected date with death from 30 years of age to more than 70, 80 in developed countries. Reduced extreme poverty from 90% of humanity to less than nine. Slash the rates of death from war 20-fold and from famine 100-fold. Even when the ancient bane of pestilence rose up anew in the 21st century, we identified the cause within days, sequenced this genome within weeks, and administered vaccines within a year, keeping the death toll to a fraction of these historic pandemics. And then the punchline from you, the cognitive wherewithal to understand the world and bend it to our advantage is not a trophy of Western civilization. It's the patrimony of our species. First of all, that's beautiful writing. But second of all, okay, then how do you explain <laughs> aliens among us, flat earthers, Roswell, uh, you know, JFK, Scientology cults, Ponzi schemes, you know, <laughs> where I sit, we're totally irrational. Yeah, well, that, that, that absolutely was the, the, uh, the, the, the paradox, the, the tension that drove the, the book. And indeed, when I, was, uh, when I first told people I was teaching a course in rationality, and then a book, the question I would get is, oh, I'm so glad you're going to explain how you know, Bayes' rule works. It was, well, how do you explain QAnon and right. chemtrails? Right. And, uh, right. and why is humanity losing its mind? Right. So needless to say, that's a, it's a uh, you know, puzzle that has led both of us to, 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 to write yeah. books and papers. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, and I do... I, I, um, do my best to, to uh, answer with the benefit of, of uh, work by, by you and other people beforehand trying to solve this puzzle. Because it won't do to just say we're an irrational species. That's the part that won't do. Because, uh, first of all, uh, how can we say that we're irrational if we didn't have some kind of benchmark of rationality against which we could say that people fall short? You know, how do we know that QAnon isn't true? Well, well we kind of were, we were rational enough. I mean, you and I and probably most listeners to know that it isn't true, well, you know, that's kind of rationality. Uh, if we weren't, if we couldn't rationally say QAnon is false, then we couldn't call the QAnon believers irrational, mm. uh, plus the, the various accomplishments that, uh, that you read in that paragraph. So there, there is a, a paradox. Part of it, um, one, one part of the resolution was the distinction between uh, beliefs in a kind of mythology zone and a reality zone, that when it comes to 
um, you know, feeding the kids and, and uh, keeping gas in the car. You know, people are pretty rational, including, I think, probably a lot of JFK conspiracy theorists. Yeah, they're you know, pretty they, normal people otherwise. Normal people and living their lives. They probably hold jobs. And they're really smart. I mean, if you if, if you talk to them, they come up with, you know, 50 arguments and what about this and that. And you can see their reasoning quite well. Yeah, do the research, they say. <laughs> do yes. the research, yes. So... Um, so part of the part of it is there are some beliefs that people don't need rational reasons for. If they're uplifting and empowering and inspiring and entertaining, you know that's kind of good enough. And the idea is, well, no, no, you can't believe them if they're if you don't care whether they're true or false. That's not the way people work. It's you, you can't find out. So you know why should I care whether they're true or false? Right. So that's one part of the answer. The other part is the the massive phenomenon of motivated reasoning, namely we often have uh, skin in the game, we're interested parties, we want some truth to come about. And so we steer our reasoning, taking advantage of the inevitable ambiguities and, and unknowns to lead to a conclusion that we want to be true in the first place. Mm -hmm. Sometimes because it serves our interests, I like to quote Upton Sinclair, it's hard to get a man to understand something when his livelihood depends on his not understanding it. Um, <laughs> part, sometimes just to flaunt uh, just to sheer um, uh, you know, dominance, you want to be the alpha primate, and you say something, and it's challenged. You got to show that you're, you know, you, that you're right and they're wrong. Um, and then, but another, and then a third big component uh, is uh, is trust in in certain truth-seeking institutions. Mm. So a lot of uh, the the scientific understanding of you know, most of us doesn't come from real scientific understanding. It's well, what the people in the white coat say. Right, uh, and I know, trust them. Good, I trust them. It's good enough for me. They've yeah. got a good track record, uh, and it's the people who don't trust anyone at a university or a government agency uh, who will be able to indulge their skepticism and pursue a mass evidence for uh, you know, unconventional evidence toward a different conclusion, and. They can't be disabused the way you and I form our beliefs, namely, well, it's just the scientific consensus. Could all of those scientists really be wrong? And some of the, the believers in weird, in weird stuff say, yeah, I think they are all wrong. And so I would yeah. put it past them to be wrong. And they're all you know, corrupt, part of the establishment and taking money from the drug companies and part of the deep state and, mm -hmm. uh, and so on. The, and just to throw one more idea into the mix, going back to motivated reasoning, Another motive, in addition to maybe you have a financial stake in the answer, you know, you have a, some kind of snake oil and it's in your financial interest to believe and to convince other people that it works as opposed to, you know, being useless. But then there's also the my side bias where the motive isn't your own enrichment, but it's the glory and power and influence of your tribe, your yeah. tribe in, interpreted literally liberally to include sect, political party, etc. So this gets to this ongoing debate about why we evolved the ability to reason and use rationality at all. And as you know, some people argue, well, we evolved to be, um, to win arguments for our side, you know, Hugo Mercier's, you know, and Dan Sperber's book on reason, as opposed to, well, we evolved to understand reality. And, you know, there's kind of a veridical perception that we really understand the, the physical world we're looking at. And you can go with the extreme version of that, like uh, 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 Donald Hoffman's um, interface theory of perception, you know, that it's it's all an illusion, really. You know, but uh, to me, that goes too far because uh, I apply the Copernican principle to myself that I'm not special. So if I'm seeing what to me looks like red and you say, yeah, that looks like red to me, chances are pretty good. It's probably we're seeing the same thing. You know, we're not completely deluded. So the idea of, of, of rationality is that there's kind of a community of people that are working toward this goal of, well, we want to understand reality. Um, so, and then in your book, you play out the kind of debate between Daniel Kahneman and Tversky on one side, we're super irrational. We have these type one, system one, rapid cognition, and it gets us into trouble. And then you talk about Kurt Gingenrinzer, who I think this is where bounded rationality comes from, this idea that it, it, that within certain contexts, the right context, we're pretty rational. So talk about that a little bit, that debate, and where you fall in that. Yeah, and um, you know, the, the brilliant work of uh, Tversky and Kahneman um, can be taken to imply that we're just a bundle of, of, of fallacies, of quick and dirty heuristics, rules of thumb, 
um, maybe a legacy of our hunter-gatherer ancestors, and you know, what, what do you expect of cavemen at a time? Uh, and Giga Ranch is, is more charitable to your typical person, noting that uh, some of the classic problems that people flood, like base rate neglect, you, uh, if there's a, a disease that's rare in the population, the test has a non-zero false alarm rate, what are the chances that someone who gets has a positive result uh, actually has the disease? Most people, including doctors, often say you know, 80 to 90%. The answer might be you know, 8 or 9%. Because if the base rate is low to begin with, if the false positive rate is not zero, a lot of, indeed, most of the positives are going to be false positives. That's just kind of arithmetic. Right. But it's an arithmetic that tends to um, elude people. Uh, Gigerenzer points out that it doesn't have to elude people. If you present it to them in concrete numbers as opposed to abstract probabilities, then you can flip from almost everyone getting it wrong to almost everyone getting right. So, for example, for example instead of saying the prevalence of breast cancer in the population is 0.01, the uh, sensitivity of the test is 0.9, the false positive rate is 0.09, what is the probability that a woman who tests positive has breast cancer? All of these are about this almost philosophical concept of the probability that a woman has breast cancer. You can say, well, what does that even mean? Either she does or she doesn't. What do you mean the probability that she has it? You know? uh, and he says people are sensitive to that distinction between probability of a single case, which is basically assigning a decimal, uh, a percentage fraction to your degree of certainty or uncertainty. And people, he, he concedes, are not down with that conception of probability. Mm -hmm. However, there is another conception, much more ecologically natural, uh, namely frequency in the long run. You've encountered a certain number of instances, a certain proportion fall one way or another, and we, people do develop an intuitive sense of which way the numbers fall. Uh, and he, just reframing the medical diagnosis problem, instead of uh, point oh one prevalence in the population. You say, imagine a thousand women and ten of them have cancer. Mm. Uh, instead of saying the false positive rate is point um, oh nine, you say uh, of a thousand people that we test, then uh, ninety of them are without. So out of the nine hundred ninety-nine women without breast cancer, uh, ninety of them are going to test positive, even though they are perfectly healthy. You frame it that way, then, and you say, uh, what? Uh, how many of those women? of those who test positive do have cancer, and people tend to get the right answer. So it's more, the, the point being that the question can't be, are we rational or irrational, but what does our rationality consist of? Mm. And often it is baked together with our subject matter knowledge. We're rational in areas that, that we are personally involved with, that we can see with our own eyes. We're good statisticians when it comes to tallying instances that fall one way or another. What we don't have is the formal rationality of formulas that you can apply to any subject matter. You have A's and B's and P's and Q's and you can plug anything in. Uh, that you have to learn in school, you have to remind yourself to deploy. Uh, in the case of uh, another unnatural thing that we now have, but we didn't have for most of our evolutionary history, is say, reliable government data sets. Mm. Uh, you know, even today, one often doubts the, how representative the data are, and it's right to do so. But for most of our history, the idea that you could you know, go to Wikipedia, you could go to Our World in Data and look up the correct answer for uh, the death rate from auto accidents versus lightning strikes, well, you just you know, you couldn't know until recently. Right. So what you're saying is that our evolved nature to reason uh, did not involve probabilities and statistics and large yeah, data sets. Especially probabilities stated, say, as, as decimal fractions. Mm. Even decimal fractions only came in with the French Revolution and the metric system. Mm. Uh, it's an unnatural way to think. It's a very useful way to think. We should teach it. But people can be you know, kind of forgiven, or at least our species can be forgiven, for it not coming naturally. And I start the book right after that paragraph where, where, uh, they, uh, where I note that... Uh, it's part of the rationale, it's part of the, the, the legacy, the birthright of humankind. I then pivot to a discussion of the, the San people mm. of the Kalahari Desert, hunter-gatherers, and how much rationality they depend on to fell the animals that provide them with their protein. Right. Namely, they track them from incomplete fragmentary uh, hoofprints. 
They argue, they debate, they take into account probabilities, they use logic, they challenge authority, uh, they distrust their first impressions. So, you know, I say, if you're worried about human irrationality, don't blame the hunter-gatherers. Right. They're plenty rational, at least in the domain that matters to them. Right. So to the question of what we can do about it, so people are capable of reasoning. The mind side bias, the motivated reasoning, the confirmation bias, the hindsight bias, those are all ping, pinging away at, at our rationality. So how do we reason with people? Uh, how do you get them? I mean... To, to go from here to there, to give up the my side, say, hey, that's your my side bias. Set that aside. And, and they'll say, no, that's your my, that's your my side bias, <laughs> yeah, right. which which we do. It's called the bias bias. The Everyone bias thinks bias. that the other guy's biased, but not them. Right, right, right. Uh, yeah, it is. I mean, that is the key question. And you know, there, there's no um, uh, algorithm for doing it. And it's, a, you know, uh, again, a question that you grappled with is uh, probably more than me. So, I mean, so here's some ideas. One of them is, it certainly are tools of reasoning. These are magnificent accomplishments. They don't come naturally to us, and they, they should be taught. They're um, more important than, I suspect, a lot of stuff that gets taught because they're prerequisite to everything else. So if you can't, if you don't know what can legitimately distinguish causation from correlation, you can't understand any idea in history, like, you know, what led to what. Uh, if you don't have a grasp of probability, you're in no condition to make decisions about your own health. So this really is fundamental, and there should be more probability, more critical thinking, more media literacy kind of throughout education. Yeah. So that, that's one part of the answer. The other is to at least recognize that there is such a thing as a, the my side bias, and that it manifests itself in hostility to science when science is considered to be an untrustworthy institution, namely one affiliated with the other side. And scientists should stop branding themselves as a branch of the political left. Mm. And I've had this argument with people in the, you know, the National Academy of Sciences that if you read their, their communications, it's like interchangeable with any other woke pronouncement from any you know, English department, from you know, any uh, left-wing newspaper. And I just could not get them to see that this is a problem. Mm. That if you, you want to know why people reject the scientific consensus? Because I think that science is just another bunch of lefties right. uh, who will just quash anything, uh, especially with when academia has acquired a somewhat well-deserved rep reputation for not being a rational forum open to ideas, but one a punitive forum where if you engage in wrong think, then your career is over, you get humiliated and shamed. Well, an onlooker looking at that is saying, well, if, if, if that's the institution that tells us about climate change, why should I believe what they say about climate change? Right. If you were to deny climate change, you'd get canceled. So I, I'm not impressed by your scientific consensus. Now, you know, you and I happen to believe that the evidence is, is pretty good for climate change, but since we are no enough scientists to know that they really you know, do look at evidence and they and, and challengers can make their voice heard. At least we, we hope they can. We have reasons, but people who are suspicious looking at the follies of academia at the could legitimately say, well, this is untrustworthy. We have uh, yeah. yeah. So part of the answer is science should um, uh, kind of look, look in the mirror and reestablish its own bona fides as an objective institution and so on with other with causes that say climate change should not be branded a left-wing uh, hobby horse right uh, find people if they are to be found on the right uh, or at least associate it with other ideas that are a little more right friendly so that people don't who are on the right don't say well uh, I, I'm just not going to swallow it so uh, it shouldn't be bundled with say anti-capitalism mm. Because then, for one, it is a separate issue, how, how to best mitigate climate change. But if you say, well, maybe the solution would be you know, nuclear power or... Um, carbon credits and... Or carbon, exactly. If, you, if some of the solutions are right-friendly. Now, when it comes to solving it, we can you know, obviously ought to do what works best and who knows what will work best. But at least if people are, can unbundle the solution from the problem then they'd be more likely to recognize that there's a problem. Yeah, you point out that, that climate change getting bundled with Al Gore with his Inconvenient Truth film kind of branded it as a liberal 
It was a, it was a strategic decided. mistake. If, yeah. If it was you know, Mitt Romney or John, if it was John McCain. Maybe. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. In the same way that I, you know, I won't give a Christian one of Richard Dawkins books about evolution. I'll give him Francis Collins because he's an evangelical Christian. One and he says it's okay to believe in evolution. And that that's like your, your team, this guy in your team. Yeah, and he's no. really smart. He says it's okay. Oh, you know, that, that, you know, that, that may be one of the persuasive techniques. Uh, Right, finding somebody uh, uh, to, to go around the my side bias. What about debiasing programs? Do they work? Yeah, a lot of them don't. And uh, Daniel Kahneman himself is pessimistic about them. Mm. But that was kind of the, the 1.0 de debiasing. Mm. Um, the, the thing is, they, they don't work, but then most education doesn't work. You know, physics classes don't work in the sense that you test people a year out, they've forgotten everything. They, right. As soon as the ink is dry on the exam, they never <laughs> think about it again. And they, yeah. you test them a year later and it's not a pretty sight. Right. Uh, so part of it is, and this is an ar argument that's been made by Dan Willingham and Carrie Morwich, that uh, we should apply what we know about effective pedagogy to debiasing and critical thinking curricula, just like we should apply it to anything, such as active learning is better than passive lecturing. Mm -hmm such as there's always a challenge in getting people to uh, transfer from the example they were uh, taught to uh, different examples. People tend, are very concrete and tend to get rooted in the particular. So you've got to present like several uh, diverse examples so that people will see the principle that embraces them all. Uh, so, and, and then some of them do work. Carrie Morwich has some video-based uh, mm -hmm. training programs that not only work, but but last. They don't have the usual fade out of most social science interventions. Yeah, so I'm amazed looking back at my uh, middle school and high school education, you know, taking geometry, trigonometry, uh, geometry, algebra, trig, and pre-calculus. I don't use any of it. Why didn't I have statistics, probabilities, Bayesian reasoning, critical <laughs> thinking? I mean, this is stuff we, every human, as you point out in rationality, every human uh, needs this. I, I it, yeah, like trigonometry in particular. Like, you know, I have nothing against trigonometry. Yeah. I actually did use trigonometry. Uh, well, that's right. Yeah. You know, you and I are both uh, cyclists, but I got a, a new bike with a different uh, head tube height, mm -hmm. and the, the I wanted to get a, a stem, an angled um, attachment for the handlebar that would place the handlebar at the same mm -hmm. position. Uh, and they only come in certain angles. So, given the length of the stem, given the angle of the stem, given the height of the head tube, what what kind of stem should I buy that uh, places the handlebar in the same position? It was a trick problem. <laughs> yes, I got to use my trigonometry. Finally. 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 50, 50 years later. <laughs> but I don't think I even heard about Bayesian reasoning until my 40s. So yeah, like that. no, that's it, right. And it, it's, it, it's just, it, it is the optimal way to adjust your credence in a hypothesis depending on the evidence. And that's something, you know, we do all the time with everything right, we believe. Right. Finally, as you point out in the book, I'm starting to hear this in pop culture, just people, just uh, casual conversations. Well, I'm just in my priors. What? <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> really? <laughs> it, it has, there has been some spillover, yeah. right? Yeah, so that's good. Yeah, so you quote uh, uh, David Hume on this, uh, and I get this all the time from people, and I don't think they read it right. Reason is and ought only to be the slave of the passions and can never pretend to any other office than to serve and obey them. Usually get this with, you know, you're, leave, you're being too Mr. Spock. You got to bring emotions into it. But what did Hume really mean by that? Yeah, it wasn't that we should, you know, shoot from the hip or we're doomed to shoot from the hip and, and you know, blow our paycheck and you know, blow our stack and, you know, and, and, and succumb to the, the, the fatal attraction. Uh, you know, blow our diets. I, I don't think that's what he meant. And I, I'm being married to a philosopher, Rebecca Goldstein. She uh, has tutored me in this. What he meant is that rationality, reason are always in service of some goal. That is, there's no such thing as just saying rational things. Uh, you know, I could spin out kind of trivial logical variations, like if pigs could fly, then Paris is the capital of, of France, which is a true statement. If pigs can fly, then Moscow is the, is the capital of France. That's also a true statement. Uh, I could be perfectly true forever, and I would not be particularly rational because mm. none of these truths are relevant to, to, to anything that you'd want, such as to understand reality, to make a prediction. So you know, ultimately, there's got to be something that you want that reason helps you uh, arrive at. And where do they come from? Well, they come from the passions. 
uh, passions in the larger sense of emotions and motives and feelings, like I'd rather be comfortable than uncomfortable and respected than hated and you know, well-fed than hungry and uh, you know, happy than sad. Those are all passions. And all of our rationality is not just saying two things, but in service of one of those goals. Or even, I'm curious. I have a desire to understand the world. That is a passion. Mm. And, and we can deploy rationality for that. And here, back to where we started, uh, I mean, this is part of our nature to want to prefer to live than die, prefer to be satiated than hungry. And, and each of those goals to which reason can be employed to more adequately achieve themselves are part of who we are, not just some random Western cultural way of thinking. Yeah. And in fact, I'm, I was, I'm even willing to go out on a limb and say, even those features of human nature are not just arbitrary facts about us, such as that we have a four-chambered heart or uh, you know, a contingent fact of our biology. <clears throat> but the fact that we are having this conversation, raising these questions, means that we have survived up to, up to this point, that we haven't been degraded by, by entropy. Uh, for that to happen, we had to have fought off you know, energy depletion and uh, disease. Uh, and so the fact that we have uh, feelings and emotion, emotions and drives, like keeping my body intact, is almost a prerequisite to there being a reasoner, as opposed to, say, some reasoning angel, but at least an incarnate reasoner. Uh, and the fact that I exist, which is kind of a prerequisite to you and me having this discussion, and vice versa, means that I have to be the kind of entity that could persist long enough to exist through, to hold this conversation. Uh, and that means that that passions like hunger and sex and safety uh, are kind of folded into the fact that, that reasoning is possible. Namely, I'm an incarnate being capable of reason. For that to have happened, I, I can't be dead. I can't have starved. Mm. I, uh, and, then, and then you make the analogy of iron filings being attracted to the magnet and Romeo and Juliet being attracted to each other. These are not the same thing. Why are they not the same thing? Yes, that's a, a, an example that I, uh, again, I stole from William James, mm. one, of, one of my heroes. Uh, and that, that really gets to the heart of rationality. Mm. Uh, what's the difference? Well, as, as James pointed out, if he um, uh, put a card between the filings and the magnet, the filings still go to the magnet. You put a wall between Romeo and Juliet. They don't remain idiotically presenting their, pressing their faces against opposite sides like the filings and magnet with a card. Uh, <laughs> Romeo finds some other way of scaling the wall, going around the wall, uh, that the, with, the, uh, with a, a, a purely physical process like a magnet attracting filings, the path is fixed. The end just depends on how everything was set up, on accidents, as he put it. With an, a rational agent, it's the end which is fixed, and the path can be modified indefinitely. Mm. So it's goal-oriented, and the, you can have an infinite number of, diff, of ways of attaining the goal uh, in a rational process. In a non-rational process, then the, uh, it's a coincidence whether you attain the goal or not. Well, I'm going to end this conversation where we began. To me, this is the tool to do all of that. <laughs> it's kind of, you should have started with this, but in any case, at some point, uh, I mean, really science, reason, empiricism, rationality, whatever we want to call it, these are the tools to understand everything else you've written about and everything else in the world back to this universal reality that we assume exists. So one final question. So you're at a Thanksgiving dinner and, and crazy Uncle Harry says, you know, the election was rigged and or QAnon is real. What do you say? What do you recommend to people that yeah. are facing this? Well, you, you can try to find you know, common ground. You can probe them for their reasons and, and uh, try to see if they're reasonable or not in the spirit of, well, let's explore this together. Um, you know, what, why should I uh, believe that and uh, appeal to uh, other kinds of to sources of authority that they themselves trust, hmm. such as the Republican dominated Supreme Court, the um, 60 other courts largely uh, peopled by Republican appointees that all rejected these claims. Uh, you kind of look for, since all reasoning, no reasoning goes back to first principles, but it starts from some area of common ground where you believe some things, well, let's see what else is true. 
you can't play that game backwards forever. Mm. So you search perhaps for some uh, common ground from which you could you know, uh, probably shift the direction of the implications. Um, there's no guarantee that you can do it, and you know, and, and, and Uncle Uncle Harry may go to his grave believing in it, <laughs> yeah. and there's nothing you can do about it. Right. But maybe you know, Uncle Harry's you know, daughter, uh, who tends to agree with what her father says, but maybe she's got a little wind, little chink, a little window of doubt, and you can try to uh, wind that. Seed. Right. I, I like to ask, what would it take to change your mind, or what, what well, would yeah. counter your belief. Yeah. The thing is that, I mean, it's an interesting uh, kind of ethic or meta ethic. For a lot of people, it would be a virtue to say nothing Yeah. because they carry over the psychology of dominance and bargaining, mm. namely the mo more steadfast person often wins in a battle of wills. Mm. Uh, that can even be praised if it's courage, if it's principle, I won't back down, I'll stand my ground. Mm. It's kind of the kind of person you want on your side in any in a kind of fight mm. uh, is a, a mindset that you really have to detach, to detach from factual belief if you want to uh, have have factual beliefs but it, and it is a dimension of personal variation that there are people who will say I uh, uh, I, can, I consider it to be a virtue to hold your onto your beliefs even when the evidence goes against them yeah uh, yeah it was like that debate with uh, Ken Ham and Bill Nye. And the moderator asked, what would it take to change your mind? And Bill said, oh, it's something like uh, Haldane's, you know, fossil rabbits in the Precambrian, <laughs> you know, something like that. And Bill said something like that. And Ken Ham was nothing. Yeah. I mean, and he got like applause in the church they were at for that. Like, yeah. So, you know, the thing about rationality, though, I mean, that, you know, that is depressing. And it's, and, you know, what do you do when, when a person carries over the uh, psychology of conflict, of zero-sum conflict into intellectual disputation where ultimately the goal is not to win but to find the truth but you know for some people it is to win um, right but you you know in theory you know, if you had enough time and uh, a relaxed enough setting if you were you know, sitting together over beers you, you could probe that well is it really right to hold on to a belief regardless of the evidence are you infallible you know, are you omniscient uh, how come you think you're infallible and, you know, other people on the other side, they might think they're infallible. Don't you think it's better if neither side thinks they're, they're infallible? I mean, you, you could, in theory, probe even that because a inherent feature of rationality is it can always look at itself. It's recursive in the sense that it can take, always take itself as an object of its own analysis. And that holds out at least the hope in principle that there may be some irreconcilable differences, but there probably aren't many given enough time and, and goodwill. The virtue of changing your mind when the evidence changes, that has well, to be promoted. That has to be promoted and it is a distinct value and it's a value that not every, that many people reject because it means yeah. that you're spineless, you're wimpy, right. you're, you're, you're a wedding, flip -flopper. you're a flip-flopper, <laughs> yes, like John Kerry in uh, 04. Yeah, I was at a conference this summer uh, that was populated by kind of libertarian conservatives and you know, masks, mandates and vaccines was all the, Rage, and so this uh, speaker gets up and he starts telling this story. I remember I covered this for this newspaper back in '89 when the journal Nature published this article that AIDS can be spread through the air and water, and therefore it's dangerous on subways or in swimming pools or whatever. And the author of that paper was none other than Anthony Fauci. <laughs> and everybody's like, oh, that guy. He changed, And then he changed his mind like two weeks later and withdrew that paper. It's like, that, that's good. That's yeah, what you're yes. supposed to do. But to the audience, it was like, oh, that guy, he just, can't, he just keeps changing his mind. Well, that's the problem. Right. I mean, there is a quote misattributed to John Maynard Keynes. Uh, when the facts change, I changed my mind, sir. What do you, what, what, change my mind, what do you do, sir? Right. It turned out it was Paul Samuelson who probably said it, but still, it's a good, oh, it's a good quote. The example of quotes that migrate up to the most famous person who ever said them. Exactly right. <laughs> exactly right. Uh, the last paragraph of your beautiful book, The Power of Rationality to Guide Moral Progress, is of a piece with its power to guide material progress and wise choices in our lives. Our ability to eke out increments of well-being of a out of a pitiless cosmos and to be good to others despite our flawed nature depends on grasping impartial principles that transcend our parochial experience 
We are a species that has been endowed with an elementary faculty of reason and that has discovered formulas and institutions that magnify its scope. They awaken us to ideas and expose us to realities that confound our institutions, our intuitions, but are true for all that. What a beautiful passage. You're such a great writer. Steve. <laughs> great I, I mean, you're a long time good friend, but I also very much admire your work. You're just, it's just great. And uh, this is your best book yet. And most important, I think, but don't stop writing. <laughs> we got to have another one from you. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me, Michael.